Okay, so let's go to the word. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to 29. God is the Lord. God is the Lord. God is the Lord. God is the Lord. I cannot, I mean, give you a verse, but starting with Psalm 16, verse 2, but throughout the Bible, if you search, it's endless uh, places throughout the Bible describes God to be the Lord. In Greek, Lord um, uh, is uh, ho kurios, and ho kurios has uh, the meaning besides Lord, uh, head. So it could also mean master, owner, but for today's word, today's message, uh, we want to focus on the part about the Lord being, uh, having the meaning of the head. So what the head represents, right? So from the head comes the entire body uh, and um, communication and uh, information and all that. So that's um, the part of the uh, Lord that we want to focus on. So that is who God is. Who is God? He is the Lord. Because from him comes all things. From him comes life. So Romans um, 11.36 says, for, From him and through him and for him are all things. So from him, for him, through him are all things. And John 1.3 um, says that it was through him all things came about. And that includes life. Uh, as John 1.4 says, Life is in him and life comes from him. So all things in heaven are on an earth, under the earth, all come from, uh, they come from him because he is the head. And because he is the head, the Lord, he inherits what belongs to him, meaning his possession, to those who belong to him. So if there are those who belong to him, he, in the, in, in the long run, in the future, inherits what belongs to him to such souls. So having faith in such God means to know one's uh, head, who one's head is. Certainly we know our head, right? Where's our head? <laughs> head and shoulders, knees and shoulders. So, so we know where the head is. So um, I'm not obviously talking about that head, but head's in a sim symbol, right? So who is your head? Who are you receiving um, your command, the command, communication, information, direction from. That is what uh, that, uh, that faith refers to. And that's to know that God is one's head. Amen. So if you have that faith, that understanding, that confession, then you have to live your life as Paul wrote in that passage, in that letter to the church or the churches in his time, which is to fill up in our flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. So fill up in our flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, the church. So there is purpose that is for the body, the church, and there is mission, and that is to fill up in our flesh, meaning in our life. While we are alive on earth in the flesh, we have to ready to continue to suffer for the sake of his body, not just in, just to say, well, I love you, Lord, and for you, Lord, for you, Christ, I will do anything. I will do all things for you. I have no problem with that, right? We have no problem with that. What do you say? Amen. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, many people have issues with the other part, which is for his body. Then they go screeching, breaking, and going, hold on a minute. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, be, but the Bible says... If the head is the Lord, the body shares the same fate and same status, same direction as the head. Don't you agree? So if we have this, the love and the honor and the awe, the fear for the head, we ought to have the same awe, fear, honor, and love for his body, which is what? Which is the church. And to resolve, therefore, living to live our lives filling up in our flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ. In other words, as I said last night in Logos, it's to relive the life of Christ. 
to live the second life of Christ. He's already finished his mission at the cross. He died and he completed by, and in his resurrect through his resurrection he revealed that and he ascended to heaven. And Jesus has nothing else to suffer because he now reigns as the Lord of all in heaven. Amen. But for the rest of us who have died to our old selves as we were baptized, right, died die to ourselves. And we resolve to be reminded to, uh, to die uh, to ourselves every day. We have to then live, not for ourselves, because ourselves have died in Christ, with Christ to, on the cross. Now live for Christ. Let Christ live in me, meaning his life of suffering. Right? Because remember, when he lived on earth, it was not a living a splendid life or a luxurious life or a comfortable life. His life on earth was about the life of suffering. So if we are living um, for Christ and letting Christ live in us and through us, it is to repeat, relive, or extend that life, uh, the public life of Christ as Messiah, as Christ, uh, as Lord, and that is by filling up in our flesh, uh, for the sake of his body, the church. So, as I've already said, the head and the body are one because you couldn't imagine uh, living without your head. One can live without a, a limb, uh, you know, of their body. It will be very inconvenient and painful to some degree, but it, it's amazing how people adjust because the body itself, it's, it, its adaptability is, is very impressive. That's how God made us. So, uh, even if people injure or whatever for, from disease or they have to, um, you know, surgically get removed or lose a limb, they continue to function, of course, not in 100 degrees, 100% uh, as normal or the past, but they do function and live. Um, however, without the head, could you function at all? Have you ever seen a headless body? Only in horror movies you've seen or, car or Scooby-Doo, right, in, in, in those very silly <laughs> cartoons because they cannot be separated at all because head... Um, is the cent center, right, the, the central um, tower for um, life and um, for direction and, as I said, for information, and uh, it directs and commands. It's a commanding tower. Um, so the way the brain works is, you know, most of us don't really think about it because it's so automatic and there are the way our bodies the motor skills that we acquire from very early on, um, from infancy to this day, unless something happens to our brain, our head, an injury or stroke, and we really do have to think about like, now I must move my foot, right? Or like, I must lift my finger. None of us really, most of us don't, at least in this room, healthy young bodies don't think about that. But when somebody is injured or especially injured in the head, they do have to think about it. And there's the frustration when it doesn't happen because the, the, somewhere, somewhere between the head and the, the specific part of the body, the nerve's not working. The communication is cut off or delayed. So um, then they become very conscious of how the brain works or is not working. But it is constantly working. It's made up of uh, billions of nerve cells um, and it's arranged in patterns that coordinate thought, emotion, behavior, movement, and sensation. I want us to think like, for a few minutes about how this brain works. Because, you know, the brain is, so, like you've seen it, in, again, in the movies or the pictures, like in a jar, it just looks like fat, right? It's just like, you've seen pictures of it, you know what it looks like. Um, but to ever think that's, that, that's you, th no one thinks that, right? Like that, that, the lump of fat or tissues that you can put in a jar. You never think like, that's me, like that, that's someone that, you know, that once lived and thought and felt and did things. But really, this is how at least science sees the human being, right? So this is all, that's where it all happens in that, um, in the brain. So the head itself is important, even though it's not the majority of the whole body. Uh, on average, on average, it's about an eighth of the body. So, you know, some people plus, some people minus. So, uh, you know, they're always outliers. But on average, uh, it's a, it's, it takes about an eighth of the, the size of the body. So it's not the majority of the body. The torso is the majority of the body. However, this is the, cent the center command um, uh, tower, right, for the entire body. And the reason is of the, it's because of the brain. So the brain's made up of all these billion cells, and it, they um, communicate and they send information, coordinate, coordinate thoughts, and send information throughout the entire body uh, of the 
you know, intelligence, emotion, behavior, uh, movement, and sensation. Uh, and it, they call it like a, it's a complicated highway system that connects your brain because it's, it, you have two hemispheres, left and right, and they also need to communicate. So you, you've heard, like the left hemisphere con um, controls the right side of the body and vice versa. As, as they also communicate together. Um, but not only that, the brain is made up of um, different uh, lobes, right? So you have the frontal lobes that control thinking and planning, organizing, problem solving, short-term memory. And then you have the uh, periodal lobe or lobes that interpret sensory information such as taste, temperature, and touch. When I was looking at that, I'm going like, man, I'm sensitive in a lot of lobes because like it's hot, it's cold, it's spicy, it's bland. Like I'm, I'm reacting so fast all the time. But uh, And then there's the oc occipital lobes uh, pro that process images from your eyes and link the information with images stored in memory. And then there's temporal lobes process that process uh, information from your senses of smell, taste, sound, and they play a role in memory storage. So just like the computer hard drive, like you know how you can set it up so your files get assigned to certain parts. You can section, cut your hard drive into different sections, and when it gets loaded and goes to the next section and so on. Your brain works like that. That's where all that is modeled after. So there are parts of the brain that actually says, it's over letter over here. We need to send it over here, and we need to clean it out, get rid of uh, unnecessary unnecessary information, so that's what they say REM. During REM stage when you're sleeping, your brain is like getting rid of the trash that doesn't need, so making more room for new information, new uh, memory. Um, so then the cerebrum is the largest part of your brain which that you think of, like this mushy stuff with the wrinkles, that's what you think of brain, right? So that is the part that is divided into two halves, the hemispheres. Um, and, that, um, and then you have the cerebellum, which is the wrinkle ball tissue below and behind the rest of your brain, it's behind here. And it works to combine sensory information from the eyes, the ears, the muscles to help coordinate the movement. So the fact that you can move and move your eyeballs without thinking like, go left. You know, you don't do that, it's just reflex. You hear somebody dropping something, you turn your head right away, right? So you don't think about it, it takes split second. But you take it for granted how quickly your nerves react. And this is all because of your brain. Your brain is um, receiving uh, receptors, like the, the sensory receptors, right? The, the communicating through the nerves is sending back to the brain, and the brain is telling back, move, right? So think about how quickly your hand, when, if it were to touch a hot stove, how quickly it uh, reacts to that, right? So when you hold a hot stove or a hot pot, uh, if you were to remain there, it is hot. Right. Now I must remove my hand. It, you don't have a hand anymore. Yeah. But it moves so fast uh, without actually calculating because your nerve system, it, when it's healthy, the peripheral nerve system, which is part of all the nerves in your body, it, that is the old, uh, nerves in your body, uh, it, it, it is what uh, acts as a communication link or relay between your brain and your extremities. So it is receiving information and then it is sending back to react to that. So it, it works marvelously how quickly uh, and how um, safely it protects itself, the body itself. So um, there are different structures. Um, oh, so the brain stem, the back of your head, um, that connects your brain to the spinal cord, uh, functions, uh, which is very vital to your body. Because, you know, when people get spinal injury, they can't move uh, and they can even die. So their blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, even sleeping, all of that is connected in the back there. There's a point on why I'm telling you about the brain, um, how the brain works. So, and, and then you have the structures of the brain that control emotions and memories, as I said uh, before. Um, there is a part of the brain called thalamus that works as like a gatekeeper for messages between the spinal cord and cerebral hemisphere. So it's like a gatekeeper. It says, okay, you're in or you're out. I don't want that information. Get out. But I want to keep that information. So there's a part of your brain that's sort of inside your head, the center part, that actually acts as a gatekeeper like that. And there's a hypothalamus uh, controlling emotions, and it regulates your body temperature and controls crucial urges like her, uh, hunger and sleep. And then there's a hippocampus, hippocampus that sends uh, memories to be stored in appropriate sections of the cerebrum and then recalls it when necessary. So it's like you know, oh, I have a test tomorrow. Like, you need to know that. That has to go to the right place, that it's, you recall it uh, before tomorrow. But if it's not working well, you will recall it next year. 
I had a test last year and I missed it. Yeah, like then you have a problem, right? So the short-term memory has to be there so that it allows you to do things, you know, now. And then the long-term memory, you store it in the backup, like the archival, you know, storage part. So you call it out. It's like, oh, yeah, when I was in kindergarten, that used to be my favorite socks. Like something like that, right? So all these things that you think of that are like floating out there all result of the working of your brain. So if that gave you a good picture of how important the brain is to dictate and govern the entire body, now let's apply that to why the Bible says uh, Christ or uh, the name Yeshua, Jesus, is the head of the church. If the human body works that way when it's healthy, the body has to be governed. First of all, belong to the head, absolutely belong to the head. And second of all, for it to live and function well, it must absolutely be governed by the head. So let's review that, those two things, absolutes. What is it? First, it must absolutely belong to the head. And secondly, it must absolutely govern. Why don't you remind your neighbor? Because some of them are already losing attention. Perhaps their brain is lacking oxygen, yeah? Tell them the two absolutes. What are the two absolutes? The body must absolutely belong to the head, and the body must absolutely be governed by the head. If you think your neighbor needs oxygen, just let me know, all right? We'll do something about that. <laughs> so the brain is that important for the body. Body cannot live with any piece of the brain, right? So brain surgeon, you, you have to be a brain surgeon. You know, they joke about that because it's the critical part. And for, imagine a surgeon who operates on the brain. It's like, don't touch my section where the piano lesson or like my Spanish lesson. It's like, I'm going to lose it. And you take it out. I don't know how to play the piano. You know, right. So like that. So the brain is so important um, that whoever handles the brain has to be, must be brainy, right? Must be really smart because the body cannot function without the head. So that's why um, the determination whether somebody's alive or not medically, it used to be the heart, but now it's the brain. So when somebody's brain dead, they're then pronounced dead. Uh, but with the, uh, if the brain is alive, then they would use machines, like a pacer, for the heart to keep going because there's a chance for that person to like, be considered alive and perhaps come back from you know, whatever their state. So the head and the body absolutely must be connected. So having that background, let's bring it back to the, uh, the scripture where it says that the body, uh, b b the body that belongs to the Lord is the church. And the head of the church is not a man or woman or people, but it is God, but is sp specifically it is the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the head is Yeshua. It is his name, Yeshua. That it is from that head, that brain, the church, the body receives command. And it is governed by his um, word, his command, the head, and that it must absolutely belong to that head. So we have that established, the relationship between the head and the body. Once again, who is the head of the church? Yeshua. And who, what is the body of Yeshua? The church. Now then, who am I? I am the church. We are the church. Amen? Oh, someone said confidently, no. Then what are you? We are? members of the body. We'll get to that in some minutes. So we are members of the body, and that is the critical key uh, component of the word today, that we are members of his body, right? So, but we have to understand the importance of the head. Follow the head. Belong to the head. But there was one creature that was made by God that initially set the mode, mood for all, the mode, mood status for all creatures by denying the head. Who was that? That was the creature, the archangel, Luciel. So he was made in heaven uh, to worship God in heaven, but he denied the head of all things who is God the creator. Uh, because he was beautiful, he was talented, other creatures, other angels said, you are so wonderful, you can be our boss. And he said to himself, sure, why not? I will lift myself up. So let's go to Isaiah 14 to see what happened there. Isaiah 14, verse um, 12. 
1412, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once lay low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down. To the grave, to the depths of the pit. So this passage is talk, referring to this creature, the archangel who was made to worship God, to honor God who is the head. From him come all things, including himself. But he forgot. And he said, I will be like the head. I'm going to deny the real head and become a head myself. You can't have two heads. There's only one head. And he was actually aiming to be the head, the most high God himself. But that moment, God saw him as evil, sin, and threw him out of the spiritual heaven. That's where it says, you were cast down to the earth. You were cast down, brought down to the grave, the depths of the pit. That grave in English, uh, is trans uh, it comes from the, Greek, um, the Hebrew word, Sheol, or uh, Greek word, Ho Hades, Hades. And that refers to the universe. So this is where that angel was contained, and at that moment he denied the head. He is called Satan. Altogether, what is he called? Satan basically means the one who denied the head because he is rebel. The rebel, the enemy of God. He becomes a rebel and the enemy because he denies the head. So he fell from heaven as a result. But it was in the same space that man was made. All things actually were made in the same space. But the man that God made from the dust of the ground, he breathed into him his breath, the breath of life, uh, the spirit that came from God, and made the man to become a living being. So man became, his name was Adam, our ancestor, became not just flesh, but to that man who already had brain, thinking and feeling and moving and all that, he was made another being uh, on top of that or within him. That is the spiritual being. Together he was called a living being. So when he became a living being, we all became living being in him. So in other words, we became Adam. I am Adam. All together, I am? I am Adam, meaning I'm a living being. So uh, this Adam lived in the garden, our ancestor, and he was to live by the word of God. But, uh, and that commanded him not to eat from one tree. But there was a serpent, we later find out, that serpent was the same being, same person who denied the head in the spiritual heaven. By then, he is referred to as the devil because the devil is the separator. And his work was to separate men, the living being, from God, the head, from whom comes life. Right? The living being has a function to live, but he cannot live on its own. He, he must live by the word of God because the word of God gives him life. Because God is the head over all things, and from him comes life, all things, that the living being must live the life that comes from him. But the devil came in between, just like I was saying about from brain and the extremities. If there is some blockage in the nerves, then the extremity, like the fingers, cannot move. And it's the same thing it, it, in terms of spiritual uh, context uh, when the devil deceived the man to eat the forbidden fruit and the man does listen to him instead of listening to God and eats that fruit. And the motive was to be like God. Same motive, same reason that he deceived himself. Satan deceived the man with. And that was to be like God. So Adam took this forbidden fruit, but we know that he didn't become like God. Instead, he became cut off from God, cut off from his life because sin entered Adam. And 2 Peter chapter 2, 19 says he became slave. And not just him, all men in him became slaves of whom? Of the devil. So if all men became slaves of the devil, then all men's head became who? The devil. Yes. Master means the head. The head means Lord. So the devil became the Lord for all men, even though that is not how it was meant to be. But this was all within the plan of God to reveal himself as the Lord of all. And he began to do his work uh, more uh, uh, directly uh, through the people of Israel. Now, when he called them through Moses, they were slaves under the Pharaoh, a prince of the world. And it was by sending Moses, he delivered them from their uh, slavery to make them God's people, God's servants. So um, after they leave uh, um, e uh, Egypt, their slavery, they're brought into the desert. How many years do they live in the desert for? 
for 40 years. And what do they do there? Oh, you didn't expect that question, did you? You're like, oh, you never asked us that before. <laughs> they followed. They followed God. They followed Moses. But how did they follow him? You know, there were millions of people, close to 2 million initially anyway. How were they able to see Moses? They didn't. What went ahead of them were the pillars of fire by night and of clouds during the day. And uh, Exodus 25, God commanded Moses to build a tabernacle starting with the Ark of Covenant. So the Ark would go before them whenever they travel. And they travel all the time for, 40, for those 40 years in the desert. So the ark was like the leader, the symbol of God's leading, God being their head, their Lord, and they all follow the ark, the Lord. So they call the ark the, the ark of the Lord God. In, Genesis, uh, in Jeremiah 31, uh, it, it says that um, God would make, uh, God made his covenant uh, with the people or the uh, patriarchs of the uh, forefathers of Israel. And when they had uh, obeyed the uh, covenant, uh, I'm sorry, the law was given as part of the covenant. When they obey the law, then God said, you belong to me. But the moment they disobey the law, what happened to them? They were cut off from that covenant, the promise. And the promise was uh, said by Jeremiah third, uh, in chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with the, their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So the imagery God is using with his relationship with his people is a husband and wife. Right, so because that relationship is based on contract, covenant, right? So you have to keep it. You have to obey and follow and agree to working together to benefit from that relationship. And it was the same for God and his people, the people of Israel. And the contract was, the conditions were the law, the law of God, the law of Moses. So as long as they obey the law, God blessed them and God said, you're my people, but the moment they disobey and walked away from the Lord uh, by disobeying the, uh, the law and discarding the, um, the law, the commandments, then God said, you're dead. You're cut off from me, cut off from the promise. So they would repeat this um, pattern uh, for uh, all their history uh, as a people, it, not just as individual, but as a people and as a, uh, a kingdom. Because we see that when God chose them, uh, God also revealed that he wanted to choose, he was going to choose the promised land, spe specifically the city of Jerusalem, which means what? Is your brain working fine? The short-term memory we're supposed to go. Did your brain work well to put that information in? What does the city mean? The city of Jerusalem, the city of prepared peace. Oh, boy. Some of your memory slot is not working. Maybe it's overloaded with other things. Time to clean up, yeah? So the city of Jerusalem is the city of prepared peace peace. So it was where God was going to uh, build. He wanted uh, Israel to build his what? His temple, the temple, right? So God designated Jerusalem uh, as the place, the city to build his house for what to be inside, to house what? The name of the Lord God, which they knew as Jehovah. Second Chronicles chapter 6 verses 5 to 6 says, and God chose to be the head over these people. So God is the head. God was the head for the people because they were the people of God. But God himself, was not, he was not directly governing them or directly, um, uh, you know, commanding them, but it was through men, right? So uh, it was Moses, but when they're, uh, later on, when, when they settled in the promised land and they wanted a king to govern them like everyone else, and they wanted to become a kingdom on earth like everyone else, they had needed a ruler, right? So who was the very first king? Technically, who was the very first? It was the king, Saul. But the one that God appointed as the king that he wanted to start this kingdom was David, right? So with um, Saul, David uh, then takes the throne. But Saul was evil. He sinned against God, and he was destroyed, and it was David. So to this day, uh, his, their descendants have the start of David, and their flag and necklaces and everything as a symbol of their nation, of their people, right? It's King David. So God chose David to be the ruler of God's people. So with, um, with Saul and David, the kingdom of the unified Israel as one nation, the monarchy, uh, was established around 1050 B.C. 
So that was a long time ago. They, call, they say it was, that it was what's called the Iron Age right, in the human history, if you know about different ages. But um, so around 1050, uh, the, the United Monarchy was founded uh, of Israel with Saul, David, and then Solomon. So for three generations, they kept the uni united or unified uh, monarchy. And it was Solomon who built the Temple of Jerusalem. Last week, you got a little bit of review on Jerusalem, history of Jerusalem and all that. But today, just a little bit about the kingdom, right? So um, it was going to be in Jerusalem. The temple was going to be built, and it was not going to be David who was going to build, even though God loved David very much, and David loved the Lord very much. Why is that God didn't allow David to build the temple? Because he was a warrior. He shed too much blood, and God was not going to have his uh, he was his beautiful, glorious um, temple uh, be built by bloody hands. So he um, gave that uh, responsibility to uh, uh, David's son, Solomon, in whose time there was no war. It was the peaceful time. So Solomon built the temple of Jerusalem. So those three, for three generations, they had the united monarchy uh, in Israel. But after Solomon died, uh, his son, Rehoboam, takes the throne. What happens to the kingdom? It splits. So there's sort of like a rebellion um, in, within, the, uh, within the monarchy. Uh, among the 12 tribes, uh, the nation splits into two. So the 10 tribes go up to north and find, uh, they found um, the kingdom of what's called the northern kingdom or the kingdom of Israel. And then the southern um, kingdom remained with the tribe of Judah and Benjamin joined uh, that. So that becomes to be known as uh, the uh, kingdom of the southern kingdom or the kingdom of Judah. So um, there were two kingdoms existing at the same time in the land of Israel. But what is sad about it is with the coming of the Babylonians and later the Persians and the Greeks and all that. And then by the time Jesus comes, the Romans occupy. But there was a time where um, the Jews do rebel uh, and then restore their kingdom for a little bit. But both kingdoms collapse. Um, first, the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. And then the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, 586 B.C. So they both collapse, uh, even though they were chosen as the people of God and God designated uh, a man, David, to be the ruler of this kingdom because they sinned against God, because they walked away from God. They did not keep their covenant, uh, the promise, by keeping the law. God gave them in the hands of their enemies to be destroyed, to be taken as exiles, and the city of Jerusalem itself was toppled, was trampled by the Gentiles and Gentile powers. Therefore, the Jews were very, very uh, desperate and, and desperately longing for the Messiah who was to come according to the prophecy. And as Jeremiah said, they waited for this new covenant that God would reveal in time. So they waited for this king of glory to come in the city of Jerusalem through the gates to reveal himself who's mighty in war and who's glorious. So they waited for the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. So we see that in the time of Jesus even, the disciples coming or other Jews asking, when is the time? for the restoration of our kingdom. Is that the time when Israel will be restored? They were so focused on that, and not just then, to this day as well, because of this notion that they had lost their sovereignty, even though they should be the kingdom that God blessed and called to be because of their sin. So they waited and waited, and as long as the temple of Jerusalem was standing there with the name the Lord Jehovah, they knew that God will fulfill his promise. So... When a man who called himself the son of God and eventually the Messiah looked at it and said, what? Made them angry, destroy this temple, and once again, destroy this temple. John 2, 19, Yeshua, or Jesus in English, walking by the temple, said, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. The Jews were not happy at all. Yes, especially the Jewish leaders, the priests, they considered it as blasphemy or challenge to their sovereignty or their peoplehood, that they were a people of uh, called by God, chosen by God to be God's people, God's nation. But here is a man saying, destroy this temple because that's what the temple represented. But Jesus was referring to the temple of his body because he said, destroy it, but in three days, I will raise it again in Again, in three days, referring to his resurrection. So if you're thinking and putting your eyes on, I'm going like, what are they thinking? I'm messing up what I'm saying, yeah? So you really need to help me out. Put strength in your eyes, folks. Amen. Look around your neighbor. You feel a little sleepy? Look on your neighbor. Make sure they're not causing you to fall asleep, yeah? You got to pick the right seat. That's why I always say. So 
when Yeshua appeared, that he called himself the son of God, sent by God, right? So he could introduce himself as son of God. And when people did say, you are the Messiah, the Messiah to come, Christ, he said, it is right. Because when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, what did he say? Jesus said, you are absolutely right. I am the Christ, the son of the living God. I am the one who was prophesied to come as the Messiah, the king, but not of this world, but of another, another world, that it is not of this place that is not made by hands or by men, but of another. So he said, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. So when he revealed as such and he was performing miracles and teaching, people welcomed him initially because they were making connection. Maybe this is the Messiah who would restore our kingdom on earth. Because remember, Abraham was the one who was promised by God that from you would come kings and kingdoms. So they remember that. So they were waiting for the man to lead them to that uh, achievement. So they wanted Jesus to be that, but they realized Jesus kept saying, no, I don't want my world. My kingdom is not of this world. And he, he uh, escaped them or he avoided them when they wanted to make him their leader. Yet when, um, for example, John's disciples came to him, Matthew eleven twenty two 22 to 3, and said, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And ask Jesus about that. Jesus said, go tell John, because by then John was in prison before he died, and tell, them what he, tell him what you saw, that uh, the blind receive sight, the lame men walk, uh, and uh, those who are oppressed are released, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. So go and say exactly what the prophecy said, that I am doing according to the prophecy, meaning, yes, I am the Messiah. But because in the end he rejected, refused their plea to become their king on earth, the people became disappointed and they all left Jesus one by one and betrayed him in the end. By the time they arrested Jesus and were, were uh, about to kill Jesus, they all said in one voice, crucify him. Because they were so disappointed that they felt so betrayed in some way. They thought this one man was going to lead them to restore their kingdom, that they realized it was not going to come true. They wanted Jesus dead. But his death was not as a result of their betrayal, but only through his death he will build a new temple that is not of made by hands, that is not of the earth, that is not for the earthly kingdom, but that is of heaven, that is about his body, that he was going to build a new temple, referring to the temple of his body, and that in that temple will be not the name Jehovah, but the name Yeshua, and that he will reveal to the world that he is not the Lord over earthly kingdom or earthly men, but he is the Lord of life. Hallelujah. So that's why he went to the cross willingly. And when he died, what did he say? He said, it is finished. What did he finish? What did he finish? He finished. What did he finish? Well, I don't know. You never asked us that. He finished the will of the Father, the plan of the Father. Let's go to John 10, 17. John 10, 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. When did he receive from the father this command? What is the command for again? Command is for him to lay down his life, to die. When did he receive that? Father, send a message, text message. You must die now. Huh? What? In the beginning. Let's go to John 1. Very good. In the beginning. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So remember, who is God? He is the head. Right? So it says the word was with God. The word was God. So when the word was with God, the word was with the head from whom all things came. So we know that the world was made by God because he is the head of all things. And that's why all things came from him. But what else is true? Here it says the word was with him when that happened. And in fact, all things also came from the word because the word was in the father, in the bosom of the father. So in verse 3 it says, through him... All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Through whom? Who is he? Through the word. 
Through the word, all things were made. And it is not without him that there's nothing that, nothing that was made without him. The, a, everything, absolutely everything was made. Everything, was, everything came from him because he is the head. And now we're talking about the word who was with the Father in the beginning. And that word was spirit. Because God is spirit. No one knew that. And the beginning is referring to eternity that nobody knew of because none of us existed then. But in time, in the history of man, mankind, verse 14, the word becomes flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So what does it say? That word came from the Father. Where did it come from? And the word became flesh, and we call him the Son of God. So where did the Son of God come from? From the Father God. That's when he received the command to do what? To lay down his life. And Jesus said, I'm going to do it exactly what the Father commanded me to do because he is my head. Amen. Amen. He was not going to be forced to lay down his life. No one was going to take it away from him. It's not because he became helpless or that he became weak or he changed his mind. But because this is why he came, the very reason of the incarnation of the word, meaning the reason for the word to come into the world as flesh, as man, was to fulfill the Father's will, which was for him to lay down his life. But do it willingly. Do it how? Willingly. And he did so. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 on says, he became nothing. He emptied himself and became nothing to the point of death on a cross. So Yeshua, the Son of God, even though he is God in his nature, having the same status, direction, same glory as the Father God, that's what Trinity means. The three persons of one God are share in the same glory, same status, same direction, same purpose. Yet when he came as man, he was going to fulfill the will, the command of the Father by willingly emptying himself completely and that was the moment he said father you alone are the head of all you are my head and therefore i lay everything into your hands hallelujah and by doing so in his submission he condemned the devil the enemy satan the enemy of god who denied the head and forced forcefully or forced on uh, all men as their head by deceiving them. Do you understand? He is not the legitimate, the legal, the real head for all men. The reason why he became one was by deceiving Adam and all men in Adam to sin. Therefore, he became the owner, the head for all men, whether we knew it or not. But the moment Yeshua died in his willing submission, he condemned this denier and through his torn flesh, he shed his precious blood. As 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19 described, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without defect or blemish. It is precious because it's the blood of God. Hallelujah. So when he shed his blood... It was to purchase the souls of all men, to reclaim them as his own, to give them life, to give them uh, all that he has in his name to his belonging to, by making them his belonging. So all men became his belonging, his possession. Hallelujah. So he died. So his death, through his death, he tore down that temple that he talked about and that is the temple where the name of jehovah was who was the owner the head of living things in the world that breathes one moment and that dies next moment but through his resurrection that the father by the father raising him up from the from the dead in three days, Yeshua raised a new temple with the name Yeshua in it, in his body. And he became the author of life, as Acts 3.15 says, meaning he became the Lord of life. What kind of Lord? What kind of Lord? The Lord of life. He became the head of life. Hallelujah. So from him comes all things, I said in the beginning. From him comes life. And it is through him that souls of men receive life. Say amen if you receive his life. Amen. When did you receive it? 
pay attention now. This is time you need to wake up and pay attention. Wake up, get rid of the scales in your eyes, and pay attention. Because if the Lord has received your worship today, you ought to be alert and awakened and be blessed by the word. Because this is the moment you're receiving life. Amen. But if you're sitting there days and thinking about something else, your brain doing its own thing, then the desire of your spirit, then you're losing God's blessing. I tell you that much. 100% guarantee you. Really, believe me on that one. This is the moment you need to pay attention. Well, after Jesus died and he ascended to heaven, through that resurrection ascension to the throne in heaven, he was acknowledged as the Lord of life. And the one who testifies that he is the Lord of life is the Holy Spirit who came in his name. Amen. So when did you receive that life? When you believe in the name Yeshua. Amen. When you called on his name, you received the blood, the precious blood of Yeshua into your souls. Say amen if you have received the blood of Yeshua. Amen. Then your soul that was once dead in sin has been raised to life. Do you understand? All men died in sin when Adam sinned because the price of sin is death. All men, whether you knew it or not, whether you, you were somewhat bad, but most of the time good, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if your mommy told you you were a good boy or the society told you you're a good citizen. It does not matter. All men in their spirit were born dead in sin, all bound to go to hell. Because that is the place where dead souls are burned forever. Through resurrection, to have, to experience death forever and pains and suffering and shame forever and ever in the darkness. That became the reality for the devil and all men having him as the head were to be destined, destined for the same place. But because Yeshua, who is the Lord of life, who will be proven to be such through his resurrection, died and shed his life from the cross by the Holy Spirit who brought us that life in his name. Simply by calling his name, we have been raised to life in our spirit. Amen. So the Holy Spirit this day, what does he do? He calls such souls who had been raised to life in the blood of Yeshua out of the world. And it calls them and gathers them in the name of Yeshua to be the members of the body, his church. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 1, to 23 says his body is the church and its head is Yeshua, the Lord. So Yeshua is the head of the church. Let's say it together. Yeshua. Yeshua. Say it like you mean it. Again. Okay, and the church is his body. So repeat that, those two things. Yeshua and we are? Now let's say the three things together. Ready? Yeshua is the head church. Is, is his body. And? We are members of his body. We are not the church, the body itself. Why do we always highlight that? It's because people look at us, look, people look at the room and say, or this building, and say, there's lots of people. This is a gathering of people. So we could have another gathering of people elsewhere if we wanted. Actually, I could kind of form my own little club in this room with the people that I like or we share some interests and views, and we make our own thing outside. Then we are church too. So this is where they don't get it, what the Bible says. Ephesians 5.30 says, we are members of his body. I'm not saying this to you because I, I want to brainwash you or threaten you in any way. Absolutely not. I have no interest in doing that. The reason why I'm saying this to you is because that's what the word says. And I honor and fear the Lord. My Lord, our Lord, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. And he says, those who belong to me, I will inherit them what belongs to me. And that is eternal life. For he is the Lord of life. He possesses eternal life in his hands. And I want that. Don't you want that? Yes. And if you want that, then you have to be found as his belonging. That you belong to him. There's absolutely no doubt about that. That's why the Holy Spirit came to not leave these, orf these souls as orphans. Jesus said, when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit, the counselor, so that you will not be left as orphans, fatherless child. 
because you receive the blood of Yeshua, you become a child of God, child of Yeshua. But if Yeshua leaves, he, and he did, the Son of Man is no longer in the world. He's no longer with us. He's in heaven on the throne. There's only one Son of Man. He's in heaven. But the one that, the part of him that's in us is his blood. In his name we receive his blood. And the Holy Spirit has come to the world to gather such souls, separating them from the world. To bring them together as members to make up that body, to belong to that body that is his church. Amen. So if the head is glorious, then the body is also glorious. And remember the two things about the head and the body. What must the body do? It must absolutely belong to the head. Without the head, it is dead. And the second thing is, it must absolutely be governed by the head. So the church must belong to the head. It must belong to the name Yeshua. It has to be governed by Yeshua. But wait a minute. You just said Yeshua is in heaven. How do we know? How, how, do we, how are we governed by him? We don't hear him. We don't see him even. What does he want? What is he saying? Let's go to Acts 20, 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own Blood. Let's read that again. This is important. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So, first of all, the church was bought with what? With the blood. Whose blood? That's not what it says. What does it say? His own blood. But whose own blood is it? According to the sentence, be shepherds of the church of God. Who's the pronoun? Which he brought, he bought with his own blood. Whose blood? God's blood. Yes, I, yes, we know it is the blood of Yeshua, but I want you to know what this text is also saying is it's God's blood. What it's saying is God paid the price with his own blood in the blood of the son Yeshua. But it is God who bought it. It is God's. The church is God's. Amen? Amen? The church belongs to God because he is the head. But he paid price for it because the devil, the thief, stole it from him. He was not going to take it back from the thief to be on his level of illegitimacy. But he legitimately paid a price. And the price was not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the imperishable, the blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect, the blood of Christ. Amen? So with that Price. He purchased his church. Yes, with souls, he purchased the church. So is it, per- it is, is it precious to God? If you paid the price of your own blood, wouldn't that object be precious to you? It would be your life because you paid with your life. You exchange your life with that merchandise or that object. In this case, we're talking about the church with the life of Jesus. So not only did he purchase my soul, therefore I became precious to him, but it's the church that he bought. And again, it's not the church is not the building, it's not people, but it's it's the body that is gathered that is made by the the name Yeshua by calling these souls out from the world, gathering them and cho- choosing them as his body. So, hey, ecclesia, which is church in Greek. Ecclesia is a compound word to be called out from the world, gather in his name, and chosen as his body. What was that? Called out from the world, gathered in his name, and chosen as what? As his body, the body of Christ, the body of Yeshua. Hallelujah. But how is this body governed then? we don't see Yeshua we don't hear Yeshua I tell you I don't he, I don't see him either not just you me neither you know I don't see him in visions I don't see him in dreams <gasps> really you don't see him you don't hear him and you're our pastor yes I'm sorry that's what you came I tell you right off the bat I've never seen a vision period I've never even seen Jesus in my dreams period I'm sorry but do I know Jesus do I honor Jesus yes I do and you know that 
The way the church is then governed is here. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So where the writer is saying the Holy Spirit has made you, the, the, the people who are referred to, those who are referred to as you are people. These are people who are appointed as the overseers of the church. And then it says, be shepherds of the church of God. It belongs to God. It was purchased by the blood of God. However, be shepherds, meaning be stewards of the church. However, this is not referring to the entire congregation. I'm sorry to say. This is not for all of you. But it is only for those few who are chosen and appointed by the Holy Spirit to lead the church. Who am I talking about? It's talking about pastor. You don't want to say it? It's about you. It's not about me. It's about you. And I think I know where this movie is going, how it's going to end. Yes, you know how it's going to end. I want to give the Bible base for you why you have to live the way you do. This is the preaching in our church. The bottom line is the same. I would call it the punchline. It's not same, like similar to many churches, many preachings. You know, it's like serve, obey, die, you know, follow and preach, blah, blah, blah. The, the punchline is the same. But where is it coming from is what we do for an hour. It's Bible-based. It's who, based on who Jesus is and how the entire Bible throughout the history of it reveals who Jesus is, who Yeshua is. Therefore, before him, we can only fall and submit to whatever he says. And where it's practiced is in the realms of the church, his body. And it is through the overseer, the shepherds of the church, that the church members are governed. Whether you like it or not, I have to tell you, yes. It's to be watched over and supervised, overseen. Because not my words, Bible, the Bible says. Yeah, it says, made you overseers. So people are like, well, don't tell me what to do. If you are one of those people, God help you, right? God help you. If you have that attitude, don't tell me what to do, then you're going to have a big problem in your spiritual life. You could have done that as a child at home or as a student at, at school or as a worker. Probably not. You try not to because you know then you won't get paid. But, um, you know, here it's like you don't pay me nothing, so don't tell me what to do. This is why people don't obey the word, period. And they don't become a member at all. I don't mean by sitting here and getting a number and registering and, you know, going to meetings and you think you're a member, but a true member a true member is a member that belongs to the body, that belongs to the head. A true member is the member that is belonging to the body, that is governed by the head. So that means the member has to be governed by the head, and the way the head governs is through these, like, um, the nerve system, right? As I say, the brain. The brain itself, the fatty tissue, is not going to every finger. It's like, move, the stove is hot. That's not what it's doing. It has to stay where it is, up here, yeah? And it's sending signals through the nerve system, right? So neuron is a call. So it's, it's like the transmitters. The transmitters are being sent, being received, the receptors, uh, through the receptors received, and then sent. So there's a command tower, but the, the, the signal is being sent through the nerve system. So the nerve system is like the overseer. The overseer is part of the body, just like the nerve system. The overseer, the pastor, is just like a member, like the rest of you. But we all have different functions. Romans 12 talks about that. Everyone has different functions. Some are called to be pastors. Some are called to be teachers. Some are called to be apostles. Some are called to be service, um, servants, uh, uh, different, kind of, uh, different kind of functions in the church. So some are called to be uh, group leaders. or Some are called to be group members. Some are called to be praise leaders. Some are called to be a Sunday school teacher or babysitters or drivers or cooks or engineers. Whatever it is that we are all called to serve and make up the body to, to, as members to, to function as members of the body. Amen? Do you realize that? Maybe some of you are like the, uh, the eye, the, the iris of the eye. Ooh, I like that. Mm. <laughs> or maybe some of your eyelashes. Mm, those of you who are in the eyelash business, those are very important. Every one of them, yes. <laughs> Hundreds of them, you need to put them. So eyelash, very important. Or the eyebrow. So all of them need to be there, right? So the eyebrows need to do you know why they're there? Not to make, not just for makeup, but they're there to frame your whole face. Not just for the appearance, but they protect the eyes. So 
the first, because you have brow, right? The brow and the eyebrows. So they're like, br they're like brush. They catch the dirt, stuff that's dripping from the head to catch, first of all, first stage. And then if whatever doesn't get caught there, it travels down to your lid, and then the eyelashes come in. Not to look like Miss Piggy with those lashes, <laughs> but, but the eyelashes are there to catch the rest that the eyebrows didn't catch. Why? Because the eyes are so important and so vulnerable, yet so important to the whole being of the body. So the, all those even little strands of hair are so important to be intact because the, for the well-being of the body, they have to do their part. The toes, the toenails, not just for painting and during summertime so you look pretty in your sandals, but they're there to protect the, the toes, and the toes themselves allow you to stand straight. Without the toes, you can't balance, you can't stand. So all the parts of the body all have function. So some of us are standing here. Some of us are sitting there. Some of us are sitting downstairs and behind the scene and the front. Everyone has function. But what the Bible also warns is that, yes, but I want to be the pastor. A lot of people say, I want to go for the goal. I want to be the boss. That was always my dream to be the boss. But then James 3.1 says, not everyone uh, should teach. Not everyone should teach. Why not? Because they will be accountable um, more in the end. So not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So unfortunately, people think like, you're not the only boss around here. Don't tell me what to do. I make my own decisions. And there are actually people who like me and like what I'm saying and how I view the Bible and how I view blah, blah, blah. So they want to follow me. So let me set up my own thing. And be the leader of my own, boss of my own. But the Bible warns clearly, you cannot be a teacher just because you want to. Pastoring is not something that you, you volunteer to be or that you go to school for. I want to become a pastor. Pastoring, really biblical, is to be appointed by the Holy Spirit as a result of, a, of, of, of his call. And it is recognized by the church for that person to be, have the faith and to be ability to lead, ability to preach. And live a life that is an example for the church to follow. Why? Because a sheep cannot overcome the world by itself. A sheep must belong to the flock. And the flock needs its shepherd. A sheep that is on its own cannot survive the attacks of the wolf. When the wolf is coming, sheep has no way to protect itself. Think about that, right? Sheep has no, it's, 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 it's cannot, um, it's not a predator, right? It, it is uh, very weak by itself. That's why it has to live in a flock together, but under the guide and the protection of a shepherd. A sheep cannot find food on its own. Who finds it for it? The shepherd. The shepherd leads the sheep. To the green pastures, as Psalm 23 says, and or to the still water for, for to drink and to eat and rest. It has to live dependent on the shepherd. So in that sense, the shepherd is so critical who you have as your shepherd. The shepherd has to know where he or she's going. Amen? Not because I'm better than all of you, you better listen up. The shepherd has to know the word of the truth, the word of the Bible, the word of God, what the will of God is and what he wants us to do. The Holy Spirit has to be pouring onto the overseer, the shepherd, the spirit of the word, the spirit of revelation and wisdom to guide the flock to the food that it needs. And at times, reproach, discipline. Why? Because the shepherd must not lose even one, not even one, of the souls the Lord has given him. So that's what Jesus said in John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. So the pastor has to have this heart of not losing even one, but that may involve not just saying sweet words, to coat, sugarcoat everything. But at times, discipline them. And disciplining hurts. But Hebrews 13 says, discipline comes from the father to the child that is his true son. So when you are disciplined, take it as a father who loves you. It's coming from you out of love. Amen? 
Amen. If you're constantly doing good job, good job, you're loved, you're the best, you're the best, you grow up not having any head, right? That's why you call big-headed person. Because they are their own head. Then we're in trouble. You know why? Because they don't listen to anybody. They listen to themselves. They don't listen to their boss. They don't listen to their teacher. They don't listen to any supervisor. They are their own. They cannot, they cannot function. Nobody likes them. They will be rejected. They cannot survive in society. Society is made up of different ranks and different people, and you are part of that structure. So you need to have a head as a child and as a member and especially in the church. So as a member, uh, the Christian then must be watched over, supervised, intervene by the overseer, the pastor. No, man? I like the peace preaching, but today I'm not so sure, pastor. Like I said, whether you like it or not, it is what it is. It is the word of God. Amen. Amen. And if you want to receive what belongs to God alone, our Lord Yeshua alone, which is that precious, glorious, beautiful life called eternal life, then you must be found as his belonging by being intact as a member that is healthy and functioning to the body that is the church. Hallelujah. And that means the overseer has to watch over you. Yes. Some people say, well, I don't want anybody to find out what I'm doing in my own time or how much money I'm giving, so don't tell me what to do. Then who is going to oversee you? Who is going to take care of your spiritual life? Who? I could do it for myself. Really? Then you don't, you're not a member. You're not a member. When the word comes, you have to obey. And that word comes through the leader of the church, the overseer. And the overseer, the pastor, or the pastors all relate the message to the group leaders. And the group leaders communicate that to the members. Yes, so there is structure in the church. The structure is this order of the authority. So the each member has the function to carry out so that the body is moving and healthy, that I'm staying alive. So I need to therefore fulfill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions as a member of his body because if the head suffered, don't expect the good life as a member of his body. If the head suffers, then the body suffers. When the body suffers, the members suffer. If the body, if the head is going through shame, persecution, the body must go through the same shame and persecution and every member of it. But what the Lord says is through his suffering, and he said, I have overcome the world. Take courage. Take heart. I have overcome the world. After the cross, he received the crown. And if the head received the crown, it's just within days, soon, in the near future, the body will also receive the crown and be glorified. And all the members that are intact, intact, attached to the body, the bride, the church. Hallelujah. So all the more we have to put every effort to gather into the church to worship. You can worship alone at home. But on the Lord's Day, we have to come together as members of his body. Once a week, we come together as a whole church, and we come and say, I'm alive. I'm still here. I'm a member of that body, the church, and my desire is to see the head in that day as part of the body. So when Jesus comes back, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says, Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection of the body, and when he comes, those who belong to him. Those who? Belong to him. Belong to him. So when he comes back, the first resurrection for mankind, not for him. He is already first fruit. Jesus is already resurrected. How did he resurrect? By becoming the first fruit? By laying down himself and becoming nothing before the head. That is the Father's will, the Father's command. He emptied himself completely. And when he did it successfully, the Father raised him up from the life, from the dead. And it's the same thing. If we want to be risen to life when Jesus comes back, say Amen. Then I have to become nothing before the will of my head. Before the will, the command of the head, I must get rid of my pride, my stubbornness, my arrogance, my disobedience, my rebellion, my worldliness, my sinfulness, my opinion, my argument, whatever it is, I must empty myself. All following what the head did. What, where the head went, I go because I'm a member of his body. And when he comes back, the first resurrection for all men will occur only for those who are attached to that body, the church. 
Certainly there are many churches around the world. And in the early church time of Paul, when he wrote that letter, there were seven churches. There were still churches in Jer Jerusalem, Samaria, and in, in, in Ephesus. All these different places, there were churches. But they all belong to this body. Then there are individual churches, and then there are members of those individual churches. So when the, when the Lord comes back to claim what belongs to him, only those who are found as breathing, living, and functioning, gathering into worship, praying together as members of the body. You can pray at home, yes, but there is greater power and strengthening when you come together to, as church, as members of the body, to pray together in this place. Amen. You can serve elsewhere. Yes, you can give your time in some kind of charity organization. You can give money to the Red Cross and save the world, save the children, or save the whales, whatever it is, whatever cause that you might be giving money away to. Some people say, I look around the world. I look at the room here and the buildings. You guys have enough money. You don't need my money. So I'm going to donate to the Red Cross. Okay, go ahead. Church doesn't need your money. It's not because the church needs your money that you give your precious $100 as your offering or, or $200 as your tithe. You're not doing it for church. You're certainly not doing it to me. I always say, don't worry. I don't, I don't take your money. I also have to give myself to honor the Lord. So you, you, if you, your offering to be received, you want your offering to be received, your tithe to be received so that God blesses your income, blesses your life, blesses your health, blesses all that you do in your family and all that, then you have to do it in the church. Yes? yes. Amen. Your service has to be in the body of Christ, the church, if you want him to remember every one of that, every hour, every, every moment that you spend. If you want God to remember, it has to be done in the church. I'm not saying don't work at, 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 in the world, but what counts is what you do for the sake of his body, the church. We praise and we preach together as church. We pray together, we serve together, we praise together, we worship together, so that in that day we are found as members of his precious bride, the church, and none of us is left behind. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Many of you worked hard for your dedication to be received this season. Really, what did you do it for? For altruistic reason that you're available to serve people and make people happy or that you're recognized as some kind of hero or a giver or a donor or did you do it because you want to be a member that loves the Lord the head therefore his body the church that you put effort to go out to the streets to look for souls because you love the Lord and you love his body, the church. That you gather together to pray and to give talent offering. To spend all that time and talent that you have. Because you love the Lord and his body, the church. If the reason was for the sake of his body, the church, he will remember. Because what you do to his body is what you're doing to the head. But if not then you ought to take this time to examine yourselves and seek his mercy to, to change your thinking, to, to repent, seek his mercy and compassion once again so that when he gives another chance that you do it for the right reason, that you confess that you are a member bought by his precious blood, belonging to the church that was bought by his precious blood so that you stay intact in that day that you'll be lifted up to see his face as found as his belonging, Yeshua! Yeshua!